everyone, and welcome to today's Seed World Innovation Series webinar. My name is Alex Martin, and I serve as editor for Seed World, and today I'm happy to be your host. Um, today's theme is Speed Up Ag Bio Testing with Ambient Temperature Stable Direct qPCR Assay. Um, I'd like to take a minute to thank Meridian Bioscience for partnering with us on this Innovation Series webinar. We have an absolutely wonderful speaker for you this morning that I have the pleasure of introducing. Um, our speaker of the day is Steve Hawkins, Molecular Product Manager of Meridian Bioscience. Steve has worked in the life science industry for over 30 years as a product manager. He gained his PhD in Biological Sciences from the University of London in 1993, and then he focused on molecular biology and biochemistry via postdoctoral work at the University of Cambridge on receptor-mediated endocytosis. In his current role, he's responsible for the marketing of new qPCR and RT qPCR products onto the market used by the, the global diagnostic industry for the development of kits. Um, now, during this presentation, you're likely going to have some questions for Steve. Um, please type these into the chat box at any time during the webinar, and we're going to address them in a Q&A session we'll hold after Steve finishes his presentation. Also, you might note that we'll have some poll questions for you throughout the presentation. These are going to pop up in your chat box window as well. We'd also like to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded and it's gonna be made available at seedworld.com in the following days. Now, today is all about introductions. Um, Steve is going to be talking to us about a new advancement in ag bio assay development for creating field-friendly, highly sensitive and cost-effective molecular plant assay. Uh, assays. But I don't want to hog the microphone anymore today. So Steve, I'm going to go ahead and let you take it from here. Have fun. Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all uh, for joining me today on this webinar. And obviously, thank you very, very much to SeaWorld for allowing us to, uh, to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Meridian first of all, for those of you who have not heard about us before. I'll give you a background in crop development and how it's changed over the last 50 years. And really just giving that background, um, bringing it into why we have developed um, this direct qPCR mix for screening. And then I'll do a roundup um, of, the, uh, of the technology. And then afterwards, you can ask your questions. So first of all, Meridian Bioscience. Now, Meridian Bioscience is a multinational company that has been around for almost 44 years now. We have over 750 employees in 15 locations worldwide. And the company is actually split into two. We have a diagnostic side, which focuses on gastrointestinal, neonatal, pediatric, and respiratory conditions. And we have a life science side, and this is focusing on offering solutions for the development of your immunological and molecular assays. We are actually located, our headquarters is in Cincinnati in the US. And for the molecular side, we have offices in Memphis. All of our R&D is carried out in London in the UK. And we have our manufacturing in Luckenwald in Germany. So if we go into the molecular side itself, we have assays that we offer for standard inhibitor tolerant, lyophilization ready, air dryable qPCR, and lamp mixes. We also have the separate polymerases and buffers. We also do reverse transcriptases, as well as things like extraction controls. And we are primary manufacturers of high quality DNTPs. All of these are ISO 13485 compliant, um, and they're being used in many areas, including things such as human diagnostics, vet testing, 
environmental testing, and food testing. So, oh, what's the background? Well, if you actually look, the world population is increasing, as we all know, and it's actually predicted to reach nearly 10 billion by 2050. And this means there's going to be a huge demand on food. In fact, they believe it's going to rise by about 100% um, by 2050. And this requires considerable technological progress to match such growing needs. Now, if you actually look at the four staple foods, maize, rice, wheat, and soya, it's predicted that they need to increase by 60% um, by 2050 to meet the current demands um, in yield, and they are falling short of this. Now, we did actually see this coming. So some of you may remember the Green Revolution of the 1960s, and uh, this enabled us to start looking at elite variety breeding, um, hybrid crop development, fertilized replication, and advances in, advances in management through uh, quite substantial public investment. And uh, as a consequence of this, um, food security has really benefit, benefited from this in many regions of the world, particularly in places like India and Southeast Asia, where poverty and malnutrition has really dropped. There have, of course, been consequences of this, you know, increase in the yield, a positive, a weed and pest control, a big positive, but it also means that the cost for the farmer has increased and there's been possible environmental degradation because of that. So moving forward from that, in the 1980s, we had advances in molecular techniques. So propelling the development of the first bioengineered genes in the plant genome. And currently, the most popularly adopted genetic modification or GMO traits are resistance to herbicides and insects in crops, particularly again in the large markets, the maize, the soya bean, in cotton and in rapeseed. And although this has greatly lessened soil tillage and insecticide use, it still does require careful management to avoid natural selection of resistance within the weeds and the pests themselves. So moving forward to present day, we now in the 2000s have sequenced not just the human genome, but the genome of many, many plants. And this has allowed us to advance the phenotypic systems where we can now rapidly select for new genetic recombinants in elite plant varieties. And complementary to this, there's been advances in targeted editing of the genome, including things like CRISPR-Cas technology. And this is helping to drive the, necess the, the necessary gains in crop improvement. Having said all of that, though, despite the obvious and clear benefits to the farmers and to the end, unit, end users, the things such as um, drought-tolerant maize, bananas that are fortified with pro-vitamin A, non-browning banana um, um, apples, you know, things like this. It's still uncertain in certain countries. You know, the acceptance of it is still very uncertain. And the cultivation of genetically modified crops is carefully controlled. And in fact, in some countries, it's just outright banned. So because of this, there has been a demand for precise and reliable techniques to detect these GMOs, as well as other foreign things, things like transgenic or pathogenic DNA in edible plants, and obviously the surrounding habitats, as well as looking for things like advantageous uh, presence or uh, copy number variations. And this has all led to the drive for the introduction of quantitative or qPCR techniques in plant research. Now, the qPCR uses primers and probes, and it allows you not only to measure the amount of, of the presence of DNA, but also how much DNA you've got there. And 
it does require purification of the DNA. So the first advance has been you know, the need for inexpensive qPCR detection. And this has led to the development of direct amplification from crude samples. So this has then led to um, you know, fast and more convenient techniques, removing the need for labor laborious, time-consuming and expensive extraction prior to the qPCR. However, the consequences is that the sensitivity has been challenged. And this is because plants, by their physical nature, are very, very diverse. So they've got very diverse uh, physiology. You've got different compositions. You've got different structures in the cell walls, um, not just between the species, but if you think about you know, within a plant itself, you've got the leaves, you've got the stem, you've got the roots, um, you've got the seeds. Um, they're all different in composition. So they are a main physical challenge to doing the qPCR. And even once you've lysed the cells, um, once you've released the DNA, you still then have the release of metabolites, cell um, constituents, and possible inhibitor problems. Then last but not least, we also have uh, the need with qPCR to keep the reagents cold. So what normally happens is the samples are therefore picked and they're sent to a central laboratory for processing. This means, first of all, you lose control of the assay. And also, and more importantly, in some cases, it means that the turnaround time becomes very long. And this is one of the issues that I know I've spoken to a number of people um, working with this about. And they say you know, it's going to take two, three, even four weeks to get results back. And of course, these plants are growing and you need the results faster than this. So this is why we developed the air dryable direct DNA qPCR mix. It's actually the ideal thing to be able to screen the plants out in the field and have the results very, very fast. So what we've actually done is we've developed it. We've got it um, with um, glycerol free. Um, it's ready to use. And it has a special blend of excipients for air drying. And you know, this is actually quite revolutionary. And uh, it really is you know, a paradox change. When you think about you know, the, um, the wet solutions, um, to be able to dry it down is obviously advantageous. There have been on the market ways, and we actually have them to dry the samples down using lyophilization. Um, but to be able to dry it down um, simply by putting it in an oven um, you know, is a paradox change. And it is very, very simple. You simply take the air dryable direct DNA qPCR plant mix, you add your primers and probes to it, you put it into a convection oven, and you simply dry it down, you then take it, you take your sample, you add your sample to it, and off you go. Very, very, very straightforward. With the development, um, with, with, sorry, with the drying down, um, as I say, it's very straightforward. The only thing you need to take into account is how much you dry it down. So you will need a precision balance uh, to measure the weight before and after drying, and just to work out how much humidity has been taken off. And you, uh, once you've actually done that a few times, you don't need to do it every time. You just need to do it if your conditions are actually going to change. But then it makes it very, very stable. And in fact, you can see here that if we take the wet mix and we run it um, as a serial dilution, we then take the mix, we dry it down, and then we rehydrate it and run it you get exactly the same CT results. You're getting exactly the same results. By drying it down, it doesn't change the assay at all. The sensitivity, the uh, limit of detection is exactly the same. Not only that, but it remains the same in more complex situations. So if you're going to be taking it and you're going to be multiplexing, so 
rather than looking at a single gene, you're looking at multiple genes in your reaction. By drying it down, you're going to get exactly the same results as if you had it wet. So there's no conditions changed there. If we then look at the uh, compatibility with plants, so what we've actually done here is we've taken some tomato leaves, we've done a punch on the part of the tomato leaf, uh, we've dropped that into water, um, we've heated that to 95 degrees for five minutes, and we've taken the dried assay, we mix the two together, and then we do the qPCR. And you can see um, with the uh, punches, we've actually taken eight different punches throughout the leaf. We've compared them with a standard. And here you can see approximately 84 equivalents um, of the genome um, for the tomato. Now, the reason why we picked tomato is actually a very good example. It's part of the deadly nightshade family, and the leaves are very rich in phenol compounds, you know, things like flavonoids and anthocyanins. And these we know are very strong inhibitors of qPCR. Um, and what this shows is the assay is very inhibitor tolerant. So it works just as well, um, regardless of what part of the leaf you're using um, you know, and, and how you're actually doing it. Of course, leaves are easy. They're soft, they're easy to use. What about other materials? Well, this is where you may well have your own assays um, uh, to do the lysis. Um, two of the most popular ones are, first of all, the hot SDS lysis buffer. This is where you take 0.1% SDS, you put your sample into it, you heat it up to 95 degrees for the five minutes, and then you take the sample. Another common one is the um, hot alkali lysis buffer. This is where you do the same with 0.2 molar sodium hydroxide, and then you neutralize it with 2 molar um, tris HDL. And you can actually see here, in both cases, with the wet and with the dried, but also, in this case, what we've actually done, we've taken, rather than taking just 100%, we've taken 25% of the lysate, and we've taken 5% of the lysate, just to show you um, the structure of the, um, uh, the um, curves. And you can see the structure of the curve doesn't change. It's because you're not getting inhibition there, and the CT values in the replicates are the same. So again, you can be you know, confident that uh, you're going to be getting the correct results. We've also looked at sensitivity. So in this case, what we've done is we've actually taken 40% um, uh, tomato leaf lysate. We've added um, rice genome to it. We've added 1,000 copies, 100 copies, 10 copies, and 1 copies. Um, of the genome equivalent of the rice um, genomic DNA. Uh, and then we've actually run it using um, the ATP-E gene. And you can actually see here, the first of all, the replicates are the same. And secondly, the distance between the dilutions is exactly the same. And it should be about 3.32 CTs. And this means that the sensitivity from dilution to dilution is exactly the same. So you're not getting any changes in efficiency. Um, you're going to get the correct results when you're actually running this, whether you've got a large amount of your genome or you've got a large amount of copies, sorry, of your, um, your DNA, or if you've only got a small amount of copies of your DNA, you're getting the correct results. We've also tested the shelf life of this. So obviously, when you dry it down, you want to be able to take the material, store it. Um, and basically, when you do the, the drying down, when you do the air drying of the samples, you're going to take that, you're going to seal the plates, you're going to put um, a uh, silica um, gel in with it dry, uh, and vacuum it and put it on the shelf or ship it out to, to where it's needed. And we've actually tested, and you can see that currently we have stability for up to 12 months. 
Um, this is new. This is a new product. We will be carrying on with the stability testing. And we're actually confident that we will be able to increase up to about 24 months or at least 24 months. So that assay can sit around for long periods of time at ambient temperature, at room temperature, and you're not going to get any difference from the original wet solutions. Again, you know, with the multiplexing, I showed you just basic multiplexing before. Here, what we've actually done, we've actually made it a proper assay. So we've taken the rice ATP gene and added 100 copies to the reaction. We've also added um, one of our extraction controls. It's actually a qPCR extraction control. And we've mixed it with 25% tomato uh, leaf lysate. And then we've looked at the um, tomato HSP21 gene. We've looked at the rice or for the rice ATPE gene. And we've looked at for the extraction control as well. And you can see these were actually done as 12 replicates. And the 12 replicates are actually giving exactly the same CT values. So you're getting high reproducibility, even with a multiplex reaction. So the types of assays, um, there's a number of different assays that people run, and it can be used for these. So things like genotyping, for copy number variation, CNV, for pathogen detection, obviously for GMO testing, for advantageous presence or AP testing, also for transgenic, even knockout analysis, all of these in crude samples. So as a conclusion, you can see it's simple, it's easy to use, it allows you to dry down your assays in-house. Um, so you're not going to have expense of having the assays shipped out to a lyophilization company um, to actually dry it down for you where you lose control. Also, it's very, very expensive. Also, you're not going to have to have it shipped to a central laboratory. Um, there's many, many qPCR machines now on the market that can be run off a battery. So you can really literally get into the field and, and do the assays there. It's ambient temperature stable. So there's no need for any uh, ice or anything like that um, to take into the field as well. And it can be used directly on the plants. So you're going to get the results there and then. So it's going to save time. It's going to reduce cost and complexity. And this will allow you to take full control of your entire manufacturing and workflow. So from that, brief introduction. Do you have any questions? It does actually look like we have some so far, Steve. So just a reminder, um, we're going to enter our Q&A session right now. So if you have a question for Steve that you haven't already asked, please go ahead and type that into the chat box now and we'll uh, start addressing them as soon as we can. Um, now, Steve, the, the very first question I received actually asked, it, it's a little bit um, kind of harking back to your bio, actually, and they wanted to know, what's the difference between a qPCR uh, test and, and, and the RTQPCR that you mentioned uh, you work with in your bio? Right, a very good question. So a qPCR test works with DNA. So you're looking at changes to the physical DNA structure of whatever you're looking for, your plant. Whereas RTQPCR is reverse transcriptase qPCR, and it's working with RNA. So this is actually looking at um, the information that's then going to produce the proteins. Um, so they do have slightly different uses. Um, a lot of people, particularly when they're actually doing modifications to the genome itself, will be looking for the DNA. But equally, there will be some people looking for differences in the RNA. Perfect. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, now, a second question we, we received um, asks, 
uh, do these buffers, and uh, I, th I believe this was on a specific slide, so I apologize, um, do these buffers work with isothermal PCR? That's a very good question, and the answer to that is the isothermal PCR is actually a slightly different technique. So it's not qPCR, it works with a single temperature, and it works with what we call LAMP. And I can actually show you on the next slide, we do actually have a Lio ready lamp mix. So the Lio ready lamp mix um, is for um, loop mediated isothermal amplification. And the advantage with this is that rather than doing increase and decrease in temperature, you stick at a single temperature. And uh, that means you don't need the Peltier heater. You can have a very simple heater out um, in the field. There are certain potential disadvantages of it. One is it does require more primers. I mentioned before that you only require two primers and a probe to do qPCR. For LAMP, you actually need six primers. So if you get them working, you are getting them working really well. Um, you can actually use LAMP you know, out in the field, and it, there's a lot of people that do work with LAMP out in the field. Um, and the other advantage, of course, we've got here is ours is lyophilization ready. So um, you can actually dry down your assay, uh, and again, you can take it into the field. And then what you would do is you would visualize it using things like turbidity, color changes, or fluorescence. Um, we are working on an air dryable version of this, but at the moment we just have the um, Lyo ready version of this. So you know, as I mentioned before, you have the air dryable really does give you full control, which is why you know, the air dryable direct DNA qPCR mix is you know, the one that I would concentrate on at the moment. Perfect. And then I had a question that just popped up while you were speaking about this that I wanted to go ahead and address. Um, so they asked, there are about eight different ISO PCR approaches. Um, is this one that you were just talking about limited just to LAMP, uh, L-A-M-P? I, I think that... You... Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, the thing with LAMP is uh, it is the most common. They're, they're, they're quite true. There are other techniques that can be used. Um, they do work in very, very slightly different ways, but by far the, the most common is the lamp, which, as I mentioned, is the loop-mediated isothermal amplification. And it's certainly by far the easiest one to use. And actually, I've just realized, I didn't answer your question before, um, buffer-wise, um, the buffers are specific for um, the assays. So um, if you're going to have a buffer for um, a lamp um, for lamp assays, it is a different buffer for qPCR assays. Perfect. And then we had another question that I think is going to help us set up some of these other questions we received, um, yeah. which is, can you illustrate a typical setup for field testing and specifically kind of dive into what materials and equipment you need to be able to um, take a sample, I think? Yes, and, and uh, that will depend on the samples you're actually looking to test. So often it's leaf punches, because apart from anything, leaf punches are very, very easy to take. So you will need a punch device. Um, normally, um, they are 1.2 millimeter leaf punches that you actually use, um, and they can be dropped straight into a tube. Uh, it's very easy to do. You've just got to be a little bit careful. I know I've worked with them in the past, and static on the gloves mixed with static on the tubes um, you know, does make those very, very small um, punches um, difficult to get into the tube sometimes because of static. Um, but overcoming that you know, um, it is very, very straightforward. Um, you're, um, if you're working with other materials, you may need a, a, a sharp scalpel. Um, if you're working with, with seeds, so this is seed world, so if you're working with seeds, um, you may um, want to um, either chop or crush. I know I've certainly worked with soya beans in the past, um, and you know, it, crushing them, getting to the, um, uh, the, the DNA inside them um, is slightly more difficult, so you will need materials for that. Tweezers. Um, uh, you'll probably need those. And then you're going to need your solution for doing the boiling, whether it's water, whether it's SDS, or whether it's um, you know, an alkali mix. Um, you'll need to take that out there as well. Thank you so much. And then I think specifically another question actually asked, um, 
from there, you, you talked about how you need to dry these, these plant tissues. Um, how do you recommend going about the drying process? Yeah, it's not the plant tissues that dried. It's actually the, um, the assay that's dried. So this is the, uh, the qPCR mix with the primers and probes. And literally, it is in a, an oven. So it's just a convection oven that's drawing the air around so that you're actually removing the moisture. Um, it's, it's very straightforward to do. The only thing you need to take care of is the amount of moisture that you take off. If you don't take enough moisture off, um, the assay potentially is not going to, is going to um, deteriorate over time. And if you take too much off, it just makes it a lot more difficult to rehydrate the assay. So if you just want you know, a, a balance there. You can actually work with dried materials. So we're talking about uh, you know, dried plants. And so uh, if the uh, if the customer, if the, the, you know, the, the person doing the assay is taking their plant materials, drying them down, taking them to the lab um, or, or taking them away uh, and then working with them. Um, certainly in the past, um, I've had uh, customers work. They probably need to work with something like um, the um, SDS solution to get to that DNA, because once the cells are dried down, um, particularly plant cells, they do require quite a lot more to get to the DNA. Perfect, thank you so much, Steve. Um, another question was asked again about buffers, um, and they wanted to know what kind of lysis buffer used for the, uh, or what kind of lysis buffer is used for tissue lysis? So again, no, it depends on the tissue. Um, you've got, um, I mentioned the, uh, the tomato, the tomato is nice and soft, it's, it's easy to use, but you've got um, you know, a lot more tough leaves. Uh, you've got you know, the likes of rice, which is a grass, which is very dry, it's very tough. Um, this really does need a, a, a much um, more harsh um, way of breaking up the cell. So this is where you probably use the, the alkali phosphate, uh, the alkali, um, uh, lysis buffer. Um, you've also got leaves which are um, full of carbohydrates. Um, and again, they can be quite tough. Um, and again, the alkali um, uh, method is, is good for that. But you've also got leaves which have, um, have got thick skins to them that may be high in um, the um, phenols. Um, and again, you know, things like um, pine seeds, um, you know, the, um, uh, the sort of needles um, with lots of resin in them. Uh, and there you're going to be you know, requiring, um, you may even need to you know, physically um, do some homogenization on the cells uh, just to get the material out of them. So it does depend on the cells and it depends on the, you know, the, the, the cell types. Okay, great. Um, another question we received is, can the air dryable mix be used as a standard liquid format for master mix, for a master mix? Ab absolutely. And, and this is the thing to point out, Joe, when you're actually working with this, when you're developing your assays, it can be used wet. And if you want to, you can carry on using it wet. So you know, if you are going to be making those assays and working in the lab with those assays, there's absolutely no reason that you need to dry them down. So they can be used wet. Alternatively, if you are going to be taking them into the, uh, into the field, or alternatively, you're going to be doing lots and lots of these, and you just want to make up one set of mixes and use them for a long period of time, you can dry them down. Um, but you're going to get exactly the same results. So it doesn't matter whether you use them wet or you use them dry. Perfect. Um, this question is actually about some of the probes that you mentioned. Um, so this person wanted to know, are all types of probes um, stable after drying? And they were specifically, I think, thinking about uh, MGB probes. Uh, yes, um, that's a very good question. Um, so the answer to that is yes. Um, what you'll often find is uh, when people buy probes from these companies that make the probes, they are often um, brought in lyophilized and you rehydrate them before you actually use them. Yeah, the, the probes themselves, there's absolutely no problems with um, drying down the probes and rehydrating them. 
perfect. Thanks, Steve. And then this uh, Ray here is looking for a little bit of clarification. I apologize if I pronounce anything wrong in this, um, but Ray wanted to clarify if the uh, polymerase is included in the dry down. And if so, how many different sources of enzymes have been validated then? So the answer is yes, uh, the polymerase is dried down. And this is one of the reasons for having the exhibitants there. So um, there's two types of exhibitants. There's one where you decrease the temperature for lyophilization. Um, so you need cryoprotection. And in this case, for air dryable, because you're increasing the temperature, you need to protect the enzyme when you actually bring the temperature up. So those exhibitants are designed uh, to actually do this. So absolutely, the the, the uh, polymerase is there. Um, we, as a company, obviously have quite a lot of expertise, first of all, with the lyophilization and now with the air drying. So um, we've actually got our own proprietary uh, polymerases we use for this. And you know, please uh, keep watching this space because um, we know from our customers that air drying is you know, a paradigm shift for all of them. It means that you can take those assays, you can now develop them in-house, you've got full control from beginning to end, and also it's costing you far less money. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the um, lyophilization companies themselves, if you send it out to the lyophilization, the lyophilization companies, they will charge you an arm and a leg to do the lyophilization. And if you do it in-house, you have to buy the machinery to do it and you need the expertise. And it's not just the lyophilizer itself. So there's also the fact that you need um, a dry environment. So it's normally dried nitrogen um, that you actually use and you need, you need this in the fume hood. Uh, so you, you need um, you know, careful protection there and you need to make sure that you have no moisture available when you're actually seeding the plates. So it does make it so much easier for uh, any developer to develop these assays. Perfect. Thank you so much, Steve. This was kind of a question that was already asked, but I it looks like they they might have elaborated just a little bit more. Um, for for field testing specifically, what kind of PCR equipment do you need? And is there kind of sort of a portable qPCR instrument that's available to use? That's a very good question. Yes, there are. There's a couple of companies that now do very, very small um uh, qPCR um, instruments. Um, one that springs to mind is the the MIC, um, an Australian company, the Corbin company actually uh, create the MIC machine. Um, that's very easily portable. Um, you can actually just hook that up to a standard car battery and you can run it off that with a laptop. So uh, there are other, uh, other ones out there as well um, and they're very, very easy to use. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, another question that someone just asked is, what is the recommended condition for air drying? So, yeah, that actually goes back to a previous question. So let me, if I can, zoom back to that slide. Um, so what we do recommend is, it's going to take just a few seconds, bear with me. It was this slide here. So what we recommend is for five mils of the master mix to put that in, add your primers and probe, heat that to 85 degrees, which is about 176 degrees Fahrenheit for about 20 minutes. Um, it may vary very, very slightly depending on the, um, the convection oven you're using. So how much air it's pushing around, whether it's actually at 80 degrees or slightly above or below. And this is one of the reasons for testing the amount of moisture by just weighing it. And uh, you know, the amount of moisture that you want to get rid of is about 95% plus or minus 1%. Um, but once you, as I say, once you've set that up, once you've done that a couple of times, you know how much um, moisture you're actually going to be removing unless you change the conditions. So if you start putting more uh, plates in there to be dried off or more um, tubes in there to be dried off, or uh, if people are going to be doing uh, opening doors and things like that, you may want to do weighing um, 
just to make sure otherwise you know, the, the condition should actually remain the same. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. I think we have uh, just a couple of questions left for you. Um, and the first one is, when doing field testing, when do you recommend doing a qPCR screening in the field? Again, you know, that, that's a very good question. And really, that depends on the, you know, on, on the person doing the testing. Um, I would say, if you're going to be working or if you're going to be looking for um, plants that are going to be changing very rapidly. So you, you want to be uh, looking at you know, the, the very young plants and you don't want them growing up before uh, they've been tested. If you're looking for spread out into the environment, so GMOs um, uh, of uh, materials from your plants uh, to other plants, um, obviously you want the results as quickly as possible. You don't want it spreading um, to, to those other plants. And so if you're going to be doing you know, not huge amounts of testing, obviously, if you're going to be doing very, very large amounts of testing, you really are going to need to take the material and send it off to a laboratory to do that, to do the very, very high throughput. But for the small amounts of testing, uh, this is going to be perfect for that type of thing. Great. Thank you so much. And then just final question from me. Um, if someone's on the fence about uh, doing a qPCR screening, why would you encourage them to do it? Uh, that's again a, a lovely question, uh, and you know the, the reason is um, one of the, the big reasons is as we move forward, as we get more and more control. Um, obviously, there's so much more we can now do with genetic modification. I mentioned the CRISPR, you know, the gene editing, be able to do very very fine. Um, changes to the genome now. There's going to be more and more demand for controls. And uh, being able to do this and be able to do this fast is going to settle the minds of you know, the, the people that are worried that we're creating Frankensteins and things like that. We're not. Um, we know we're not. We just need to make sure that we monitor and we make sure we don't do that. And so you know, it is a case of um, being able to show that so in the field, within the fields, um, you know, there's no spreading of the materials. It's being contained within the genetic modified plants. Or you know, indeed, it may be that you're not doing genetic modification, but you're, you may be screening for other things. You, you can be screening for um, you know, viruses around mosaic viruses or you know, other viruses or you know, other um, materials, unwanted materials um, within your crops themselves. So it's what, what's actually very interesting. Um, and it's just a slightly aside here. There was some testing done a few years ago on mushrooms, and uh, there were some mushrooms that were being sold in in a supermarket, and they actually tested the mushrooms. And of those mushrooms, only about fifty percent of those mushrooms were actually the correct mushroom. The rest of them were different species of mushroom and some of them were actually unknown um, to the scientists they would never been seen before so to be able to know that um, what you're actually serving up to your customers you know your the, the foods you're actually serving up are the correct materials is actually very very important so um, yes just a, a word of caution there Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Um, that's all the time we have today. Um, so I'd like to thank Steve for joining us today. And I'd also like to thank Meridian Biosciences for making this webinar possible. Um, we'd also like to give a big thank you to everyone who participated and asked us questions. And we absolutely hope you found some of this information of value. Um, Again, just a reminder, a recording of this webinar is going to be made available later um, this week at seedworld.com. So if you missed anything or you want to go back and rewatch, uh, make sure to check out seedworld.com for the recording. Um, thanks again so much, and we hope you have an absolutely terrific day. This is Alex Martin of Seedworld signing off. <laughs>